Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Everything that's happening all around us is like a virtual reality world being projected from another dimension or through some kind of technology. So you and I live in a virtual world that's being inputted by by various sensory data inputs. And then that causes our psychological and mainstream media temporary reality. Now, it's amazing how many events of great, enormous significance will take place in our society, America, the world, the European Union, etc., nations. These these super events or these super crisis events happen with like clockwork like regularity. That's why on the back of my book, uh, the greatest battle for the hearts and minds of mankind in the history of the world, I have a picture. Somebody took of me standing by that big gold clock with the American flag, giant American flag uh, draped behind it. Um, And it's right at the midnight hour, and I'm standing there in the uh, Grand Central Station where all the the train hub is, as most of you know, for New York City, the suburbs, other states, etc. And and, uh, nobody planned for this picture to be on the back of the book. Nobody even thought about it uh, regarding the book at all. It was just an interesting shot that somebody took because of where I was physically. But the book had such so many layered prophetic overtones that we decide to, to use it. But, but, here, but here's the thing, okay? When you've been doing the kind of research that I've been doing for 40-plus years, I say 40-plus years because my research started at 15 years old. What can I tell you, okay? If I was to tell you differently, I'd be flat out lying. I'm telling you the truth. It started actually earlier than that. Because I wanted to be a scientist when I was a kid. So I built a big laboratory in my bedroom and read the biography of all the great scientists. And I really, really was interested in scientists, uh, being a scientist, physicist, nuclear physicist in, in particular. So what I began to notice as I was writing these prophecy books and analyzing current events over the decades in light of Bible prophecy, what I would notice is a continuing reverberating theme that would like recycle every so often. What I began to notice is something that maybe you began to notice. And that is, I, I began to notice And this is not the product of scientific method research. This is just the product of of human observation in writing so many books. I began to notice that there was an emerging and conspicuous pattern that I began to uncover in my research regarding most of my books. Like, are you ready? The uh, Who Will Rule the Future, and many other books. And what I began to notice is that that many, many times in history, especially American history, but also global history, there would be a catastrophic or cataclysmic event of sizable proportions. Okay? And... The amount of frequency that this would occur, and then yet same at the same time, simultaneously, there would be some kind of governmental, military, or institutional dry run, uh, where they were going to act out, where the military, where the military-industrial complex, where 
different factions of our government and uh, uh, services, etc., would would act out a mock response to to a mock uh, super crisis event like. Um, it could be anything. It would be a, a nuclear event. It could be the when they were going to change when all the computers were going to change their clocks uh, event to to a simulated coronavirus event. So so what I'm telling you is that if you and you don't have to you know spend uh, thousands of hours in the library or something. What I'm telling you is that with a disturbing frequency, you will notice that. Many times before some mass shooting breaks out, but before some mass military casual event, military casualty event happens, or whatever, there is some kind of dry rehearsal, some kind of military civilian mock response team type stuff going on. And you might say, well, that goes on all the time. Well, yeah, it does go on all the time. That's true. But I'm talking about when you when you continually see a merge a couple of days after school shootings or this event or that event or this event or that event, when you continually see a pattern of specific participation in mock events or trial events by civil service agencies, by military, by National Guard, by police, etc., by, by hospitals, when you continually see uh, organized, planned responses happening to a super crisis event that has not yet happened before, and then within a conspicuous period of time, after they do their training, like it could be two months, it could be the next day, it could, it could have been earlier that day, Within a very conspicuous amount of time after this training, then a real event happens. But it's always a weird event like one that has never happened before. Now, let me give you just a, a, the, the most recent. And as, I, and as I suggest to you, you know, when I write my books, etc., the Holy Spirit guides my research, guides me into what area leads me into pockets of information. So um, I've been aware of this for a while. You may have been aware of this for a, a while, too. And it was a posting that the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, the big, big globalist elite money family, the Rockefeller Foundation, they were the ones that tried to finance the first. Um, uh, United Nations. They were the ones that uh, tried to finance the second United Nations in 1948 uh, and, and build that uh, huge structure in Manhattan. And the United Nations, um, the first prominent Rockefeller was John D. Rockefeller. And he was a man of very mysterious origins. I, I won't get into what his origins were, but let's just put it this way. There are numerous authors who have done investigations to his background, and his background is always very questionable. But he's very, very, very wealthy. So, in October, and, and, and if you go to it, I'll have a link for you on my website. To this article, it's the Rockefeller Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation National COVID nineteen Testing Action Plan, and I'll have a link for you at paulmcguire.us so you can check it out. And uh, the point is, is that this National COVID nineteen <coughs> Testing Action Plan. It, it, it predicts, in their words, pragmatic steps to reopen our workplaces and our communities. And notice it says to reopen our workplaces and communities. 
Okay, well, but we have a problem here, all right? On, on this giant full-page article by the Rockefeller Foundation, they, they came out in public in the month of April, this, this past April. Uh, they came out in April and called the nation to get 3 million COVID-19 tests weekly by July and 30 million COVID tests weekly by October. And then they say to beat this virus, we need a massive national update effort to get up to 30 million and beyond with tests that are easy. Now, what's interesting about this Rockefeller Foundation financed uh, website and COVID-19 response team and research, et cetera, et cetera, is this. This is the smoking gun that's going to cause you to ask questions. Uh, Now, right now, they're talking about on the Rockefeller Foundation website, it's all about the need to get Americans back to work again. All right? But you have to remember that the original, the original COVID-19 response uh, test that they rolled out, okay, um, The, 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 the entire concept of a, a national lockdown, quarantine, social distancing, the social distancing, uh, global lockdown, all of this, okay, was designed, it was designed to deal with a coronavirus pandemic. And it was designed and written long before the coronavirus broke out in the world and before it broke out in the United States of America. This is critical to understand. This is absolutely critical to understand. Um, So... The question has to be asked, how did the Rockefeller Foundation, how did the World Health Organization, and they're funded by Bill Gates, how did they know about the global uh, COVID epidemic before the coronavirus epidemic happened? So I'm reading a WHO, World Health Organization, pamphlet right off their own. WHO uh, website, World Health Organization, part of the United Nations. And they did studies and uh, uh, projections of a full-blown global pandemic uh, and how to prepare for it uh, with vaccinations, medication, and everything else. Now, what we have to remember is that these these plans, when were these plans uh, initiated? And remember that COVID-19 comes from the biological agent SARS-CoV-2. Okay? So this has been around... Uh, for a while. Now, the other thing that we have to understand is that this research report uh, was put together in 2010. 2010. 2010. This was put together. A complete master plan. Okay? Coronavirus 2010 document doesn't prove pandemic was blah, 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 blah. Well, let's read you what blah, 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 blah says. I don't want some 
Googlebot to erase for me what blah, blah, blah says, because it usually will. So it says right here, in a July 15th, 2020 article, okay, in that article, it refers to a coronavirus 2010, coronavirus 2010 document, and doesn't prove the pandemic was what? Why do you have to dig for it? Because they don't even know it. It's a Rockefeller document. Rockefeller Brothers Fund I've document. Lost 13 pounds so far, and I'm only so five. there's their little commercial running. I'm going to set that down before I have a major migraine from listening to the lies. Uh, okay, a 10 year old document was dug up because some thought it showed COVID 19 was pre planned. So this is, this is an attack piece on the COVID 19 article from Rockefeller that suggests that the Rockefeller uh, COVID-19 pandemic was pre-planned. So this is an attack on what they call alternative media. Uh, And they've come to the conclusion. See, you've got millions of Google bots uh, creating stories and websites and blog sites and links and chains and everything else blasting the internet consciousness universe with with so-called news stories that uh, that there was a trial run in 2010 by the Rockefeller Foundation and the Global Business Network uh, to to look at four hypothetical scenarios so according to to all these uh, Websites, they said there that they that the Rockefeller Brothers Fund and, and Future of Technology and Development were were looking at four hypothetical scenarios within their 2010 report. One was a pandemic like the like the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, one was a scenario called lockstep. Does that sound familiar? Of course it does. Uh, and lockstep is when an authoritarian government, like in communist China and other authoritarian governments in the world, where they will hijack the hijack the global pandemic. Authoritarian totalitarian governments will, will hijack the global pandemic and and use it as an excuse or a pretense for social distancing mechanisms and mass surveillance, which are really nothing more than lock you up in the re-education camp, prison camp of the mind time. Okay? That's what it's really all about. So this stuff started to happen in 2010, experimentation. Uh, And then there was another study um, in 2012, another study that, that where it doesn't break out until 2015. I mean, a lot of studies, and you're hearing audio noise. It's it's the ads buried into the thing. I'm not going to race every time ad chatter pops up. Okay, so what we have to understand here was there was planning involved. Now, when I first heard this kind of talk. Let's let's put the cards on the table here. When I heard this kind of talk about the Rockefeller Brothers Fund Laboratory and the Rockefeller Brothers Funds uh, this and that, all right, I took it with a magnificently huge scoop of uh, ice cream, organic ice cream with chocolate chips, which is really outrageous. Okay, here's the thing, though. When I first heard this, it was on a radio show. Many, member, many of you may remember the name of this very uh, uh, well-researched uh, doctor and, and friend of mine, Dr. Stan Monteith. And I used to listen to him on KBRT radio in Southern California all the time, going back decades. 
And he began to break the hard, crusty ground in my mind of bias. See, because back, if you go to Paul McGuire back 30 years ago, I hadn't quite cracked through all the icebreakers of of uh, conspiracy, the, the real conspiracy theories that were true. Okay, and Stan, Mon- Stan Monteith had a program, Radio Liberty, and he exhaustively researched him. I listened to his program, we became friends, I became a guest on his show, he became a guest on my show. I learned a lot from him, and he really did his homework, Dr. Stan Monteith. Um, in fact, there was some discussion that, that people wanted me to be the host of that program. <clears throat> um, because Dr. Stan Monteith has, uh, has since gone on to be with the Lord. Now, I, I, as valuable as his work is, I don't have time to do his work and my work, but his work was extremely valuable because he documented his assertions as I do. And we, we, when we would be on each other's radio shows, we would laugh about the latest stories of where we were each accused of making stuff up when it turned out to be true. Okay, so I remember <clears throat> the year was approximately, and I'm not saying this to, 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 to just sell a book. I always have to say this as an author, and it's annoying, but, but, but you can't blame authors for wanting to sell books, for crying out loud. If authors didn't sell books, we couldn't write books, and that would be the end of that. So, <clears throat> but I remember... And I'm, I'm not just bringing this up to plug a book. I'm bringing this up to, to show you how the way the world really works. <clears throat> the only reason this book really isn't for sale anymore. I mean, if you call Paul McGuire Ministries or order on the computer, you can get yourself a few copies. And, and they're older copies, okay? So that, that means they have a slightly, the, 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 just from the age of the page, they're slightly brown. Don't get all disgusted. That's the way books used to turn years ago. Okay, but they're in perfect condition. Now, that's in case there's a, there's a few people who might want one. But that, after that, we don't have any more. Unless I do an update on it. But why I'm telling you about my book, Who Will Rule the Future, which was a co- has a copyright date in it of, uh, of uh, 1991. In Who Will Rule the Future, I, I, we, oh, I think it was on, yeah, it was on Stan, I was driving around uh, Costa Mesa somewhere on, or somewhere, I don't know where I was driving around, <clears throat> and listening to Stan Monteith's show. And Stan Monteith was talking about a nefarious group of super billionaires and, who, who hired scientists. Um, to fund specific experiments that would further their radical agenda. And what Dr. Stan Monteith was talking specifically about was the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. Now, what he said on the air about the Rockefeller Brothers Fund was so shocking to me that I I didn't believe it. You know, most of the stuff that I write about, I initially didn't believe in. And it's not because my, my, my brain is that of a flimsy crackpot, you know, whichever way the wind blows, my, my brain's going to follow. That's not, that's not it. It's just that some of these things, when people tell you, until you see the documentation, they're just too outrageous for me to believe. So when Stan Monteith talked about the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, I said, no way. This, 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 it can't possibly be this conspiratorial at the top. This is just like... Way, way out there. I mean, really, really. You know, Stan Monteith, he's in heaven now, but I said he must be getting ready to go home to be with the Lord because uh, <clears throat> when he talked about how the Rockefeller brothers organized their billions and billions of dollars to promote different radical social movements, radical one world government radical, one world uh, economies radical, one world um, um, religions, uh, all 
funding of, 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 of a radical new world order in very practical and dirty terms. Okay? So, what I discovered was that the Rockefeller, he said this on the air, he said the Rockefeller Brothers Fund spends millions, no, billions of dollars uh, uh, propping up very attractive, uh, charismatic female movie stars, TV stars, news personality stars, and, and they have all one requirement. They must, according to the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, is, is that the Rockefeller Brothers Fund will raise these fiercely independent feminist superwomen up because they want to project a mythology in the mass mind among women, which is that for the ideal women, for the ideal woman just sitting at home and being a mother is hell or purgatory. The only way a woman can truly be fulfilled, according to the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, is to work full time, to have a really high powered job like a movie star, or a TV star, a director, or other elite positions. And so, how, how am I going to find proof that the Rockefeller Brothers Fund ever said this, that they ever wrote this? According to Stan Munteith, and I didn't want to wait and order a copy through his ministry, he said he, he has written documentation that this is what the Rockefeller Brothers Fund has planned to do and is doing it. Okay, now here's where the miracle comes in. Back when I heard this program, this was... To, to show you how long I've been researching this stuff, and it's it'd been inch by inch the entire way because I don't believe anything I hear unless I can back it up with documentation. But the bottom line is that the uh, the social engineering that the Rockefeller brothers were spending billions on. They wanted to prop up women and men in the popular culture for specific message messages about role models. So they wanted the stereotypical American woman or Western woman to be gung ho, have an exciting job, TV star, movie star. They would secretly promote them uh, to these high uh, positions. They'd be secretly promoted. And the reason they were secretly being promoted, if they, as long as they had the right politics, the right environmental beliefs, the right feminist beliefs, that the right abortion beliefs, and that they were financed by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. And so I decided to do something, because this is before computers, before cell phones, before laptops. There was no internet. There was no... This was back in the, the, the wild, wild west where you had to go to a local public library, God knows where they were, and you would give them the topic and they would go through this thing called microfiche, which is like a, a plastic laminated piece of paper, which really was a photograph, like a slide photograph of, of written pages of books and magazines. So I happened to walk around this, I just picked one library. This is the Holy Spirit guiding my research again. I pick one uh, library, and, and I pull out the book, this obscure book by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, their report from some year to some year. And I think it was the report from 2004 to 2005, which was the exact year I needed. So anyway, bam. I get to the library. I, 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 they actually have a physical copy of the, the bound book or report for the exact year I want. And I am reading sentence after sentence <clears throat> about how their plan is to artificially raise up women in the culture through the mass media, turn them into superstars and role models as working women, as social women, as non-married women, as sexually promiscuous women, as non-Christian women. In other words, deliberately inject into the culture the mass stereotype of a super-feminist woman who is not into marriage, not into child rearing. She's just into career, a social life, promiscuous, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I could not believe that is as outrageous as that promotional scenario sounded. That's exactly 
basically word for word, or almost word for word, what the, uh, it gets worse, what the Rockefellers were claiming was their goal. And it was horrific. It shocked me. It shocked me because the, the, the inertia, it shocked me because the intention was so evil, was so wicked to, to destroy Western civilization and identity. I mean, that's what the goal was. But, but it didn't just stop there. I began to read after, this was in 2005. This is when, you know, I began to recognize something wicked comes this way, one of Ray Bradbury's famous science fiction books. That something very wicked was coming our way in society. And I began write, to write book after book about it, I, based on Bible prophecy and my research. And I would speak to millions of Christians on television programs and radio programs and all kinds of things. And they would always be hiding and denying and, and, and being angry and pretending these things weren't true when I would quote for them verbatim, word for word, sentence after sentence, paragraph after paragraph. I would quote from them the exact details, plans of these satanic globalists and what they had in mind for the human race. But you go through the other books I've written, and I, and I quote other documents, which give long lists of things like how they plan to, in the future, rip down statues with ropes. Yeah, I talked about that years ago in my books, not just like last week years ago, um, how they plan to have race riots to divide our country into a new civil war, and on and on and on, that there's a full-blown effort by the Fabian Marxists, uh, the communists, Marxists, socialists, full-blown financed by the globalist elite and the super capitalist banking families to create a Marxist communist revolution in the United States. And, and turn this into what Aldous Huxley called a full-blown scientific dictatorship. That is exactly where we are. And this UN Agenda 2035 is just the latest kicker in this social engineering experiment that's designed to destroy America as we know it. And that's where we are right now. That's where we are right now. The future is being rewritten in front of our very eyes. And it's, this is not paranoia. It's not science fiction. This is, this is the real deal. It's happening before you. And unless, see, why did I write the book? Why did I title it? Again, this, the purpose is, was not to sell a book. The purpose is to sell a book in the sense that the purpose is always to educate God's people and give them the truth that will set them free. That is true. No, no retreat, no surrender. But the reason I call the book, Who Will Rule the Future? A Resistance to the New World Order by Paul McGuire is because I'm trying to teach the, the, the reader, Christians especially, that ruling the future is not just up for grabs. Somebody uses their willpower, their intelligence, their education, and their knowledge, and the person whose diligence shall bear rule, and the slothful shall be under tribute. It's God's intention, if you read Bible prophecy, for his people to rule the future. That's the whole point of the book. The book was an attack not on Bible prophecy. The book was an attack on Bible passivity. And then, you know, these books keep coming fast and furious, like um, Mass Awakening, like um, uh, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. All these things converging, and these guys planning out in the opening with think tanks, spending hundreds of billions of dollars. They, they write openly. They've been writing openly about this since the early 1800s, for crying out loud, and before the 1800s. Think about this. Uh, and I, I break it down for you in bite-sized, chewable bits. They, I break it down for you that they've been planning revolution. They've been planning to remove certain races through targeted abortions, um, um, 
the uh, wiping out of of billions of people on planet Earth, trillions of people on planet Earth. That they have a secret list of superior races versus minority races, and they intend to wipe out what they consider to be genetically inferior races. So all of this is part of a dark, satanic master plan. You say, well, how is it satanic? Well, you you have to understand that indeed, as the science fiction writer Red Bree Bradbury said, indeed, something wicked is coming this way. And then you have to understand that the, the, the wickedness we're describing has been predicted by the Bible and is happening on a societal level right now. But we're not supposed to be apathetic. We're not supposed to be in la-la land. We're not supposed to be in daydream bill. We're supposed to be occupying the land that Jesus Christ called us to occupy until he comes. And that is a doctrinal theological statement. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. You are listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. In my book, I'm holding uh, up a copy of a book I wrote in, what was it, 1991? Yeah, 1991, called Who Will Will Rule the Future? We don't have that many to sell. It's a great book. We have a few to sell. So my motive is really not to sell you this book. The other books are available. They're great. Really will help you. <clears throat> this book will blow your mind. It, it'll, it'll give you knowledge as power in a, in a very biblical way. So I wrote this book because at, at this time, everybody, not everybody, there were a lot of people in, in conspiratorial writing circles who were writing books on the New World Order. Well, I got sick of reading books on the New World Order, so I decided to write a book which was a resistance to the New World Order. Every Christian I read, they would just say, oh, the New World Order is in Bible prophecy. Let's bow down and and, and worship it. I mean, essentially, that's what they were were saying. I mean, they tell you that the consequences were getting the the, the, uh, nanochip implant, but they didn't do much to equip you to deal with it. <clears throat> so the point is that <clears throat> in this uh, <clears throat> new world order, uh, there the new world order is happening because, as I say in this book, who will rule the future? I quote from Revelation twelve seven. Quote, and there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels <coughs> waged war. So there's a war going on right now in the invisible realm, the parallel universe, the spiritual world. Remember quantum physics and uh, string theory physics has told us that there are approximately 12 the 13 dimensions in our universe. Part of that is the reality that beyond time and space, there is a a spiritual world where there's an all-out war going out between Satan, the fallen angels, God, his angels, etc., etc. It's an all-out war in the invisible realm. Right? Very important to understand this, because this is the primary spiritual battlefield that you and I will engage in as Christians. Now, I wrote this book in 1991. It had huge distribution because of God's blessing. I was on Pat Robertson's program a bunch of times, the 700 Club. I hosted a conference, a Bible prophecy conference for Pat Robertson and... uh, Um, they they offered this book, Who Will Rule the Future, on their television network. So the point the point is that <clears throat> um, in the book, I I write things such as 
uh, well, in chapter four, I have, it's called Millennial, Millennium Three. And I'm going to read you from my book. What is the future of America and the world going to hold? Are we heading toward Armageddon, nuclear destruction, an ecological disaster? Or are we going to build a paradise on Earth? Mankind is racing toward a destiny as yet unknown. However, we will it be at peace and prosperity or global totalitarianism with unequaled oppression and bloodshed? Unlike many of the so-called prophets of doom, the rosy-eyed optimists predict a new utopia. I do not believe the future is fixed. It is true. God does know the future. However, we have been given the power of free will and choice. We will determine our collective, collective destiny. The prophetic book of Revelation will unfold exactly as God predicted it would, but it will be a future radically different than what the, the vast majority of so-called prophets have outlined. Mankind is on the brink of a brand new world <clears throat> and the emergence of a new world order. The human race is entering an era of untold magnific magnificence and technological breakthrough, as well as a series of sudden disasters and holocausts. So, then I write, I quote from uh, uh, Huxley's book, The Shape of Things to Come, his movie, excuse me. Quote, America, no, no, this is my book, excuse me. Um, America and the rest of the world is racing to the future. What's on the horizon? Things like geodesic dome houses, robot butlers, kill pills, electronic psychedelic drugs, video telephones, three-dimensional television, simulated or African safaris, and a host of new inventions. Okay, now here I start to write, and this is, happens quite often. I start to, to predict things through research and the Holy Spirit and the knowledge of a particular science. So then I start to write in my chapter uh, entitled, The Shape of Things to Come, I write, quote, The capacity for good and evil will be increased in the near future. Many churches will televise their Bible studies and the Sunday services through cable television in an unprecedented manner. Even small churches will be able to keep in contact with their congregation electronically. The pornography industry will get into three-dimensional television rather quickly and will offer electronic stimulated fantasy sex where people will electronically enter their sexual fantasies. The average American is totally unprepared for what technology is about to unleash on us good and bad. And I'm not going to go into the bad or the good here. Well, there is no good. It's all bad. Okay. Um, so, so I talk about this technology and the fact that churches more and more in the future, even small churches, are going to be using, you know, technologies like Zoom and Skype and 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 Microsoft and other stuff to to electronically social distance, and have electronic church services. But then I have a chapter entitled Scientists and Visionaries Who Are Designing the Future. Um, and here's where it gets dangerous. So in this chapter of Millennial 3, I write these words. Quote, These social engineers attempt to build a brave new world by tinkering with powerful forces that, although utopian in outlook, will produce the dehumanization and enslavement of the human race. For example, psychologist B.F. Skinner's utopian novel, Walden II, presents a future community <coughs> built on Skinner's ideas of behavior modification <coughs> and conditioning techniques. Excuse me. <coughs> Futurists and social engineers have used Skinner's behavior mod techniques in attempting to restructure society. 
Both the Humanist Manifesto I and the Humanist Manifesto II have brought us closer to what George Orwell wrote about in his novel 1984, where the Ministry of Truth used such slogans as War is Peace, Freedom is Slavery, Ignorant is Truth. We have such double talk slogans in our culture when we say pro pro choice, but mean the right the right to murder babies or if it feels good to do it when we mean giving in to our most base instincts and so on. So <clears throat> then I have a chapter called Social Engineers of the Brave New World. Uh, and I give warnings. This is back in nineteen ninety one. You're not gonna want to hear this, but let me tell you something. Unless you do something intelligently and effectively to stop it, it's on its way uh, in terms of coming to fruition right now, even as we talk. There are powerful activists who want to bring about, quote, what they call the normalization of human sexuality so that it would include regular uh, sexual contacts between children and adults. That's what the that's what, what the World Health Organization wants. That, that that's what the same organization Psychus wants. That's educating your children in, in, in sex education. They want it to include pedophilia. All right. So then, in Millennial Three, I talk about the restructuring of Chairman Mao's China using Planned Parenthood technology. Planned Parenthood technology was paid for by the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. She put up abortion clinics in all the minority neighborhoods because she was on a campaign to exterminate minority neighborhoods. All right? And then you had intellectuals like the great sci-fi author Isaac Asimov who was one of the authors. Uh, he, He did the Foundation series and iRobot which was made into a movie with Will Smith. And, uh, um, oh, this is the guy that interviewed me at the Lambs Club in Manhattan. I couldn't remember his name. Bill Moyers. Uh, I think he's gone on to be with the Lord. Anyway, Bill Moyers and people like Isaac Asimov were militant humanists. <clears throat> and they wanted to use Darwinian evolution as a basis for a global humanist, New Age, Marxist, sci-fi transformation world, if you want to call it that, because that's exactly what they planned. Now, the point, the point is this. This is the point. <clears throat> we are moving here with lightning speed. <clears throat> when um, the, the super billionaire... Uh, Elon Musk, whether he actually has a neural implant in his brain yet or not, I don't know, but I suspect that he does. I couldn't prove that, only because he's been boasting about all the <clears throat> the uh, brain enhancements that having a neural brain in, in chip implant would have if you had one in, in your brain, and he's sat in the chair and demonstrated it. So I suspect that he that he has an enhanced brain via a a brain chip implant. Also, you have to remember, when when, um, he's talking about his perfect world, he says, when when we're selling uh, Teslas, you know, his futuristic car, he said, he, he went on record by saying, we're not selling cars. We're not just selling cars. We're not just selling Teslas. We're selling joy and pleasure. You see, that man is a genius because he understands that when people are buying a Tesla, like I have a neighbor that has a Tesla, so I guess I'm late in the game because I never had an opportunity to drive a Tesla up until the last six months. But I have a neighbor, not my immediate neighbor, but a neighbor, who drives a Tesla, or the Tesla drives him around. Um, He's in a very high-end industry, that's all I can say. And um, he is, um, you know, 
totally into the technological thing. They're, they're very impressive cars. And um, the, the Tesla car has artificial intelligence. It can drive itself, he says. He says it's illegal to drive itself, but it can drive itself. So Tesla is thinking of the future, and you watch. It was such a it was such a historical shift. You see, when I was a kid, we were brainwashed into the the propaganda that that it was either or. We were told by the media <clears throat> that it was either going to be millions and millions of people in poverty <clears throat> in our ghettos, <clears throat> or. Uh, we would spend hundreds of millions of dollars on rocket ships going to the moon and Mars. But if we were really a compassionate people, we would get rid of the, the vehicles to moon and Mars, and we would we would only you know take care of poverty on Earth. That's a very seductive lie, <clears throat> and it sounds appealing. But what it really does <clears throat> is it kills. The vision of the people, and without a vision, the people perish. So when you saw, and this is not a, this is not a partisan statement. When you saw this epic picture of Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX taking off from, I think it was Cape Canaveral. I'm not sure. It was such a historical, epic image. Mankind getting into this evolved, futuristic rocket on its way in a series of other rockets to go to the moon. Mankind's future tied up to, to some degree with mankind's technology, and mankind was planning to go to the moon. It was futuristic. It said that there was hope and possibilities for man. It did not say that man is trying to be God. No, that, that may be in, man, in, in man's heart, and God will have to judge him. But one vision of the SpaceX going up and the latest technology said there's a, there's a hope, there's a future for mankind that we unite. But the other vision of mankind was Machiavellian, the totalitarian governments and, and brainwashing and mass surveillance and computer surveillance and freedom nowhere. You see, we're right at the crossroads. We have the technology, the science, the artificial intelligence the 5G, the whole thing, to build a, a viable utopia on Earth. But that viable utopia on Earth cannot be completed unless there are safeguards for our Bill of Rights, our, our freedom of speech, freedom of the press, right to bear arms, uh, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, unless those are structurally and embedded into the design of this new American dream, they're going to come, the, 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 the George Orwell people, they're here already, man. You saw the movie, maybe. Um, <clears throat> the movie with, uh, it was about these space invaders that came from another planet, and they, they, they ate up, they took over human consciousness. The first movie was in black and white. The second movie was in color. Donald Sutherland played in the first movie, and uh, Nicole Kidman played in the second movie. And these space invaders came in the form of, of a virus and infected people and took over their consciousness. And so the whole world was succumbing to this alien invasion via uh, invasion of the consciousness of our minds. And it was very terrifying. It was a warning. But in the same way, <clears throat> This virus in the minds of men, this virus that they can be God, that they can be Lucifer, that they can be cruel, that they can be punishing, <clears throat> and that there is no real God, is a very seductive ideological virus. And man succumbs to it from time to time. Adolf Hitler did. <clears throat> That's why he tried to build a master race and killed 30 million people in the death camps. So we have to move forward with technology. <clears throat> but we also have to move forward with ethics, morality, and true humanism, which is not secular humanism. It's humanism based on the truth that man has been made in the image of God. That's what's before us. So we have this cataclysmic spiritual battle happening right now. 
in America and across the world. We have, we, we have the need for mass surveillance and neural implants. We have the need for technology, for, for, for the virus and everything else. We, have, we, we can take a quantum leap. That's why I wrote my book, Who Will Rule the Future? See, why I wrote the book, Who Will Rule the Future? And my latest book, The Greatest Battle for the Hearts and Minds of Mankind in the History of the World. Why I wrote it and why I wrote the others, and you can get them in a bundle discount. I wrote it is because every prophecy book I, I, I've basically written by other people <clears throat> basically says there's no way out of here except for the rapture. There is no hope except for the rapture. God's people are damned, doomed, signed, sealed, and delivered except for the rapture. I'm not against the rapture. I don't teach against the rapture. I believe God is going to rapture his church at the appropriate time. However, I believe that in addition to a rapture of the church, God does promise to, to deliver us from the wrath to come. So the key here is that God wants to deliver us from the wrath to come. He wants us to occupy the land until he comes. And he wants to use us supernaturally in a powerful way to win souls, to make disciples of all nations. And so in this time period between now and whenever it is that the Lord Jesus Christ chooses to return, he's given this, this phenomenal supernatural opportunity to do all this. So I want to encourage you in joining me in doing all this by helping us occupy until he comes, by helping us go into all the world and preach the gospel. I'm asking you to be a prayer partner with this ministry, to pray for me, my family, um, this ministry, to pray for um, the people we're trying to reach, to pray for our outreaches, and we're asking God to uh, supernaturally intervene and give us a divine reprieve so we can win souls to Jesus Christ and that we, so that we can um, make disciples of all nations and bring in the last day soul harvest and go about doing what our Father commanded us to do. Join us in the, in the pillars of this ministry because, hey, folks, you know it and I know it. We're at the end of the age. This doesn't go on forever. That's not fear factor. It doesn't go on forever. We're at the end of the age, and has, God has a job for us to do. So, go to paulmcguire.us, send, send and spread these programs far and wide. Send the audio programs, send the video programs, send the written programs. Spread them far and wide by going to paulmcguire.us. Um, send uh, the pictures, the videos, the articles, the books, and let's ignite a biblical third great awakening, a biblical revival, and let's take back our nation while we can. God bless you. This is Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. And help us spread this timeless message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us spread it far and wide. <music>